for the benefit of people who are uh, would like to read later and I've just turned our um, live transcription our closed captioning on for those people who uh, who need that so without further ado I would like to turn it over to Roxanne and Lana and I look forward to receiving your wisdom and hearing your stories today thank you for being here Wow. What I I am a so I always greet you in my first language, which is the Plains Cree language. I originate from the lands of Chief Conmaker and Big Bear, three and a half hours east of here uh, from Edmonton. And my Cree name is Gamiwa Bigwani, Blossoming Flower. But many of you know me in my colonial name is Roxanne Tacusis. And so I'm honored to be invited here. And we always want to start in uh, the way that we are encouraged to start with the original instructions of bringing uh, prayer into our session. So the words that we exchange with you, share with you today will be uh, taken in a good way and help expand your awareness of we, our two mothers, Lana and I, have come to understand our trans children and uh, celebrate them, the uniqueness and the teachings that they bring to us. So we are presented with protocol, tobacco, and a floral print by Jessica. And so I want to honor that before we start. And I'm using this prairie stage to smudge them. And as you know, at McEwen, we always start in this good way. We always, always start our events with the land acknowledgement by our hosts. And then oftentimes with grandmother's teachings, I take off my jewelry. And because grandmother's teachings are such that we remove what we can only because to our worldview, Cree worldview, I am taught that we all originated from this place of uh, spirit or the unseen world. And when this life is on loan to us to enter into this physical world, we weren't born with the glasses and all the accessories now we can adorn our bodies with. So I'm always reminded when I present myself before Creator and the ancestors and the workers that I do it, do this in the most humble manner to honor and acknowledge them. And so again, tobacco speaks for us. It opens that spiritual doorway to where they reside in spirit world. And the prayer flag is to honor my helper, that Nukua Tayogan, that legendary grandmother that resides in between the east door and the south door, because this is where uh, this is where she resides and helps me in this work. So I'm just going to lift it up, invite all the grandmothers, grandfathers of all the sacred directions to come and bless, bless the sacred space and all the participants that join us from near and far and give thanks for the gift of another day and this opportunity to be able to share these perspectives of uh, Indigenous mothers of Lana and I in the best way that we can here today to celebrate Pride Week. So, I hey no mamu tau inante mantu. How gista ate yoga na kada ni sta mo ekskenta ko. Kami wa pe ko ni tinstiga asun. Hego ma semi na mista hina nasko ten. Uma gikseva tunwa o kagi tunwa o hego ma ko takiska o kape o wihia. Ni nasko ten ni no ma kaki o kau yeta me ek nista ante sa kami ta ma gita tuskenwa o nista ko koy pasagupta ma. Te pia o magi ko e mia asik nista ante ko instu tua agamita ma sagitua. We titua exisuma nisna and gagam, snagam haya, mithe nanoma, who is the owner, how at the nisna and wiggy way, nisna and excaten and my guys casquita nisna, they sagamitin and go with the hog door simsak, exnisis in the nascum one, a gaggy going one good to ten, when is the a big wimp swan, my cock yog exaway, and we star exisum gagi with the master of the piogi way, a meow, sinisins in the nascum one, 
So again, Creator God, I give you thanks for this wonderful opportunity that you bring us here together. I give you thanks for your love and kindness and compassion for all people. And again, I'm grateful that you give, uh, open this door for us to come and share our perspectives as Indigenous mothers to celebrate our, our, our children uh, who identify as being trans. And I ask that you open our minds and hearts to the participants and all that are here to listen to our presentation. And I ask that you continue to guide us in the ways of our original instructions that we are encouraged to follow with always being um, uh, loving to each other, kind, understanding, caring of all things good is for the benefit of all. And so these things I give thanks to you to all my relations. Hi, hi. So to honor that protocol. And that's the way I choose to honor these requests so that they can proceed in a good way. So it's in themes. Lana, you're good with that? And so I will start with the presentation. And I'm just gonna sing a lullaby song because we're talking about mothering they, them. And while La Lana gets the PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to just sing you this song. I guess I was talking really fast. My presentation was only 12 minutes yesterday. <laughs> um, I uh, wanting to make sure is, can you see our um, presentation yet? Yes, it's on the screen, Lana. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, you know, money. Hey, Lana. So how we know money, our Utsi connection. Uh, so like I shared in my introduction, I originate from the lands of Chief Homemaker and Big Bear. And you can see I'm in the left, uh, on, in the front row, the grandpa from the second from the left is Big Bear. On the opposite side of him on your right hand, right hand side is Chief Homemaker. Those are my great, great grandfathers from whose lands that I originate from. And being a product of resident uh, uh, child, a middle child of nine, and I had parents who are products of residential school, as were my as are my four older siblings. I am told that in the 60s, it, we still practiced traditional adoption. And so uh, I was given to my maternal grandparents to raise me. And that's them that you see on the right hand side. That's my maternal mushum and gukum, my grandma and grandpa. And that's Mashwa Awasis, their child, and Etwa Hut, that's a bluebird on the right. And so that's who raised me because, and I'm told when the Indian agent came for me to go into residential school, I'm told by my auntie, late Auntie Julie, that my gukum hid me under her bed so that Indian, wouldn't take, Indian agent wouldn't take me because my cooking was hearing all the horrible experiences our children and grandchildren were coming home with from residential school that she didn't want that for me. And so I'm so grateful to her uh, for, uh, for doing what she did to prevent me uh, 
go into those systems because they grounded me in my first language, Nehiawewin. And they taught me how to pimatisu, how to live off the land and sustain life from the land and its resources. So we always had a big garden. My grandpa raised thoroughbreds and raised thoroughbreds. He was a horseman and we are always out on the land to harvest our medicine, pig berries when our cousins would come home from residential school in the summer. And so I'm so grateful for that. And then they grounded me in ceremony. So the next slide. As my as identifying as can um come you they raised me in ceremony and on the left hand side you'll see a Sundance Lodge with my late sister and I. The young pretty little girl there on the left was my late sister Lori Petusa. She passed away unfortunately last uh, September 27th. And she's now an ancestor and in the spirit world. And that's me on the right one. It's so cute. <laughs> But then, so I was grounded in knowing who I was um, as a Plains Cree woman. And then my parents came to get me. And at about the age of six, and the middle picture that you see was when Christianity, when the Black Robes entered our community. And that's Father Parody. They wanted to Christianize us because uh, of the government policies of the day that wanted to assimilate us so they would go away with the Indian problem. So that's my older brother Malcolm in the blue jacket, myself in the middle again, my late sister Lori on the right. And despite my parents and older siblings not acquiring a quality education in the residential school system, my grandpa always told me to uh, and parents always encouraged me to go to the Western world to acquire that quality education. And so in November 20th of last year, I was able to acquire uh, a graduate certificate in spiritually informed psychotherapy. And I have still yet to complete my, uh, my graduate work in the area of perinatal law. So that's me upon convocation. So. Yeah, so despite the challenges, we've been able to have both feet in both worlds to try and help my, my the people, uh, the indigenous people of these lands. Next, so in terms of raising, I'm blessed with, I always say three daughters and the middle uh, slide there is uh, my niece who, I consider my daughter because she was going to be put up for adoption and I would not have it. So I told my dad to take me to the foster home and I would go and get her and raise her as my own. And because my sister, late sister at the time was only 15 when she parent was when she uh, had her. And so um, being so young, she didn't know how to parent, but I said, I'll, I'll take on the responsibility. So I actually went and got her in residential school. And there you see her, that's Laurel, and she's online with us here today from uh, OMAC, Washington. Hi, him. And uh, my grandchildren, Kailani and Kaylin. And then I have two biological uh, daughters. Uh, Niska on the right, on the right hand side, you see her in her jingle dress, and my baby in the little grass dance outfit was born a he is now a she. And that's who I'm going to speak more specifically about today. Uh, she was born a he is now a she. She never changed her name, she remained Kwana. And so I'm so blessed to have been gifted her uh, to be loaned, to loaned these beautiful children of creator, to raise them in the best way that I can. And I've tried to raise them through this logo that I borrowed from Think Indigenous, to always know who they are, where they came from, and how to live this life in the best way possible through, through our culture, through our language, our traditions and beliefs. And so when I speak specifically as an Indigenous mother of a trans child, it brings me back to the moment of when I was 20 weeks pregnant with Kwana and I almost miscarried her. And 
I struggled with this, but I had a good conversation with my Nassim is here, Lana, to say, how far do I go in this presentation? Uh, and I wasn't sure how much I should share truthfully from this experience. But naturally, she, uh, she encouraged me just to speak my truth and my reality. So unfortunately, I was in a really a violent and abusive relationship that caused me to go into premature labor with Kwana at 20 weeks. I thought I was 25, but when I was laying in the Vancouver General Hospital, I was told I was only 20 weeks pregnant. And I was in a panic when I couldn't find a heartbeat, when the doctors couldn't find a heartbeat. And I was panic stricken because I couldn't fathom as a mother what that would be like to lose a child. And so I pled with Creator and I, I pled with him and I said, please, please, I'll do anything that they tell me to do just to keep this pregnancy and go term. And so in, in that moment, I just lay really still until again, we could find a heartbeat. And every five weeks thereafter, I went into premature labor because this little Kwana sure wanted to come into this world blazing and roaring. And so I went into labor at 25 weeks, at 30 weeks, finally at uh, 35 weeks, the doctor said, we can't, we can't, uh, uh, we can't continue to stop, stop uh, labor contraction, she's just going to have to come. So she was born five weeks prematurely. In my prayer, I said, I will do, I will protect you, I will guide, uh, guide you in the best way that I can, just keep breathing. And so that was really uh, an intense moment for me. And I'm still honoring that pledge that I made to Creator in connection to Kwana because at 15, she disclosed to me, we always knew she had these female mannerisms. And we knew like, ah, she's possibly gay. That's okay. That's cool. Right. And she often would prefer to slap on her sister's uh, high heels and play clothes and <laughs> jingle dress and mm, something different of my child. So at 15, Kwana disclosed to me that uh, she was, he was gay. I said, okay, cool. And it wasn't until she was uh, 17 that uh, she had since moved with her father in Victoria that I got a call from the psych psychologist telling me that she had threatened her life three times and uh, that she had disclosed and had diagnosed her as being transgendered. And I thought, what is this now? Like of all the challenge we've had, challenges we've had to endure to kind of try and help her uh, ground her, um, coming from divorced parents and all the uh, factors that come into play, being indigenous and now being gay and now transgendered, I thought, what? Is going on here, Kwana? What more can I handle <laughs> as your mother? But then, uh, you know, uh, 20, uh, 12 years later, and I say, uh, why not? You know, why not me, right? Because in the process of our growing and learning, there's many times we agree to disagree. And, but through it all, you know, I asked Kwana today, I said, what was the determining factor that helped you to be who you are today? Because she's a huge advocate in the transgendered world, a musician, an artist, and now in film school. And one of the things she said, mom, you just love me. So one of the four incidents that really solidified that um, understanding of her uniqueness, that despite what I said, you know, that she was determined to be who she was. And the first time she said, mom, I'm the happiest I've ever been, was when she went through her gender reassignment surgery in Montreal. And I was in a panic because we had a plan in place. I couldn't go to the surgery. Um, but her dad was able to accompany her and I said, make sure you call me and let me know how, sur uh, how the surgery went. I didn't hear her for four days and I was panic stricken trying to, you know, contact her and see how she was doing. And then she finally called me on the fourth day, all groggy from morphine. And she said, mom, I said, my body rejected the surgery the first time and she almost bled out, she said. So I had to go into the OR a second time and, and then she was recovering then and said, oh my God. So again, she's had her challenges. And but that's when she said, mom, I'm the happiest I've ever been because now she could be, you know, 
who she felt she was. She always felt trapped in, in her body that she wasn't born into the right gender. And then the second time she said it was when she got her breast augmentation and had her lightning bolt tattooed on her breasts. And she said, mom, she calls me up. She says, I'm the happiest I've ever been <laughs> because now she could be who she was identifying as a, as a female. And the third time was she always wanted to go into makeup artistry. So when she completed Completed the Blanche McDonald make global makeup artistry program. She called me up again and she said, Mom, I'm the happiest I've ever been. So doing what she felt was one of her life's passions. And then the last time she called me, she went to Guadalajara for her feminization surgery. Again, I couldn't go, having worked in the healthcare field. There's something about supporting families in hospital, but for my own, it too hit too close to home that I couldn't, I couldn't be a benefit to her at bedside. I had one of her friends accompany her for her feminization surgery, where she had her hairline lowered, her nose redone and whatever else they did. And all bandaged up, she calls me again the fourth time. And she says, mom, I'm the happiest I've ever been because now she is physically, you know, who she felt she identified with. So those are four hope for happy moments despite challenges. Um, the reality too um, is that, you know, initially I really had to become mama bear to her because of the homophobia in my family. I couldn't always be open to the truth of who Kwan identified with. And being, and my family has since worked through a lot of that, but still some of my family is still quite homophobic. So I dare not share that she's tra she's trans now because of the transphobia still, you know, trying to grapple with being gay is, and then now to be transphobic, it might be too much for some of my family to try to understand. But my daughter Niska has been most uh, instrumental in helping to me understand the pronouns now, the LGBTQ and two spirit identify with. And so my, my first question to her was, how did you tell your friends, right? that Kwana was now a he and now a, was a gay and now tra transgendered. And she said, mom, that's really simple. She said, I told my friends, remember Kwana when he was a he? Well, she's a she now, she said. I said, that's it? <laughs> so I stole that and that's how I, I chose to tell some of my family, friends and loved ones. Well, remember Kwana as a he? She's a she now, right? And most of them, they're very um, understanding and acceptable of her. But one of the most scariest realities that I, I was challenged with was when my daughter called me from Vancouver one night and uh, they were, uh, Kwana was being assaulted by three male uh, Caucasians coming out of a nightclub. Then somebody said she had a gun. And so the SWAT team was called Lots uh, and they took a, a broken bo beer bottle to her because she's known as a, a model at the time for transgendered and uh, they took a beer bottle to her face and to protect herself. She, you know, there was lots of blood to try and shield her face and lost her phone in the scuffle. So she was unfortunately taken into custody um, because of whoever said had a gun and I had to communicate with my daughter Niska throughout the days to try and ensure that she was okay because there's so much blood in, in, in the panic of the situation. But uh, about two days later, we were able, four days later, again, she calls me and she says, mom, she says, I'm okay. And, I, and uh, this isn't the first time this has happened. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> She just normalized it like being trans woman, this is, this is part of uh, what she has to endure. And being in the entertainment business, it's all, you know, a lot of parties, drugs, alcohol, and as an Indigenous mother who follows the ceremonial pathway. I finally had to take her aside one day because there were nights where I would be looking for her. She called me, I didn't know where she was, and Vancouver being such a vast 
see. I would be driving up and down the streets trying to look for her, trying to find landmarks. Like, where are you being so uh, strung out? Finally, I had to say I had to quit. And I was able to take her aside before I moved from there to say, you know, one of my biggest fears as your mother is that I'm going to get that knock on the door or that phone call to come and say, to come and identify you. So think about every time you take that bottle, you know, or that next food, what that does to me as your mother. But luckily she knows, my daughters know, I follow the ceremonial route. And I'm always, the only thing I have, because they're young adults now, is that they don't have, I don't have the power or control over them to make decisions for them or believe Winkle in their decisions. But the only thing I have is, you know, my tobacco, my sweet grass, to say, Creator, God, please, look after my baby you know look after my babies so that they'll always be safe and so periodically Kwana will call me and say mom where are you going i said i'm going to a ceremony oh she'll say are you gonna pray for me <laughs> so if anything she knows you know that you know despite sometimes the poor choices she might make that mama's always there look after her and I've always tried to share that teaching my grandpa always told me and that was and my grandpa always shared with me to always know who I am as a plain Cree woman and I'll never get lost and I've had to reflect upon that on numerous occasions as a mother as a daughter as a sister, as an auntie, as a kukum, as an academic, as a professional to say, what does that mean? And so one of the lessons that I've learned through this process is what never to compromise my identity as a plain Cree woman. And that's what I've tried to relay to my daughters. And my students, um, now that I work at an, a post-secondary institution, those students coming to Gail Watson, uh, that we will provide them some tools to know who they are, where they come from, and how they're going to lift uh, their, their, the work in whatever capacity that they go into, whatever field of study they go into, that they will leave this place better than the way they entered into it. And so that's been always what's helped me kind of keep going despite the challenges, you know, what legacy am I going to leave behind for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, and those children still yet unborn? I have a responsibility as a young grandmother to ensure that I leave this place better than the way we entered into it. So, next. So, who is Kwana Style? She's all of this and more. <laughs> She's a wonderful inspiration because she, uh, when she enters in the room, you know Kwana's in the house. And so she's really taught me to find my voice, not to be, uh, be fearless in terms of speaking my truth. And so she's, I'm, I'm just so super proud of my daughter in terms of where she's been, where she's going. And now being in a, a film school to speak her truth, I can hardly wait for what she's going to produce and share with the world in terms of what it means to be a trans woman and in, indigenous on top of that. So I'm super proud of her and I continue to learn and grow from her. And yeah, we have the best disagreements as well. That's part of parenthood. <laughs> and I'm grateful for her sister, Nista, who continues to just, you know, love each other despite their differences too. And Laurel for always being there for me to just, yeah, keep me grounded in my grandbabies. And all that you are watching here that just continue to, to love, love me, you know, despite you know, some of the challenge I share with you in uh, being who I am as the mother of these beautiful gifted children, young adults now. So with that, that's kind of my portion. And I'm just going to share with you a quick video to share who Kwana is and 
where she's come from. Hi, hi. I am back in Kamloops. My mom has photos of me going to Kamloops a powwow as a little boy. When nobody was home, I would put on her jingle dress and be like, crank the powwow music. And I was always looking out the window, worried about being caught. But now I'm ready to dance and let everybody see me. here feels right. And you know what? I got my mom over here. I'm so excited. Oh, my baby cute. <laughs> I actually might need you to make me hair ties. Okay. Like, like soon. All right, let's go get some bannock. Let's go eat. Come on, mama. I'm going to go for it. Let's do a bannock cheeseburger for breakfast, and I'll get an Indian taco for lunch. Oh, oh, hi. hi. How are you? Thanks nice to finally yes, meet you. Yes, you too. How's it going? Good. How are you? Well, I'm better now. I just got the bannock knife on him. I designed my regalia. Well, just the high switch. <laughs> <laughs> it goes up to here. Just kidding. Dancing Jingle to me is a celebration of who I am now and of my culture and a way to embrace it and honor it. When I was growing up, there was nobody in mainstream media that I could relate to. To have an opportunity to be that person for other people now is pretty cool. No, I'm not getting any weird looks, but I got a couple winks. I just hope that by sharing everything that I do so publicly and openly that I can help create a better understanding of what it means to be transgender and to help break gender barriers. Hi. Hi, we're just wondering what these cameras are doing here. The... Um, we're shooting with APTN for um, a docuseries. APTN, the docuseries? Okay, yeah. perfect. We're just wondering. Thank, Thank you. you. I thought he was going to hit on me. I thought you were going to give me your number. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a taste of who Kwana is and becoming. So I thank you for listening. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Uh, I hope everybody was able to hear the uh, video or, and see the Oh, we also did that one. Oh, you talked about that, kind of. Nimis? What? This last one, you had one more. <laughs> oh, where is it? That, what's the last one? Keep it real. Oh, right. The lessons that she's taught me always is, yeah, number one, keep it real. Despite the harsh reality of what it means to be indigenous in today's world you know always combating that systemic racism and violence and yeah um i do my best you know in whatever capacity that i am and more personally in my personal life you know to be to be my truth to be who i am and she's teaching me to come out and come out come home to the truth of who I am as an Indigenous mother too and speak my truth that I'm blessed to have a trans uh, child, now a trans, a dynamic trans woman and to embrace her uh, and just uh, celebrate the uniqueness. And always, where's my slide tape? It'll have, it'll cue me my slide, Lana. I hope you can see it. I have it. Oh, now I'm back. Can you see the slide? I just see the mothering they them slide. Uh oh. Modern technology has its benefits, but sometimes. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah, number one, and always know who I am, always to share with them, you know, the, the, the statement my grandpa made to me is to always know who I'm, I am as a plain screen woman. And I, I'm trying to share that with my daughters today. And um, know the language. I know I faltered as a mother to pass on the Cree language because there is um, a, la a language is secret. Our Cree language is, is quite spiritual. And so now as a young Kokom, you know, I try and do my best to get them online with me to learn. <laughs> but what I discovered, and this is something I've learned that uh, when I was discovering Kwana Kwana's gender identity uh, was not male, I often asked myself, why me? And like I shared now, I say, why the hell not me, right? <laughs> Because yeah, I have lots to share in terms of where I've been, where I'm going, uh, where I've come from, where I am today, and the direction that I'm going collaboratively with another amazing mother, Kawi Mao, Lana Whiskey Jack, who's going to share her story. Um, and uh, talk to me, welcoming, you know, having an inclusive attitude so that we can embrace our children. And it's a reciprocal relationship where they teach us in terms of what their world is like and what our world is like and bring the two together so that we can have that on that balance in all aspects of our being. And so with that, thank you. Bye. -bye. I turn it over to my sister now. Hi, that way. Um, can everybody see the PowerPoint? That's all I see. So I just wanted to make sure. Yes, we can see your your adorable face. Okay, wonderful. Um, so Tansi Kakiao Nwagamaganak, Lana Whiskey Jack Nitsiga, so Nonix Kapone Kotsinia, Egwa. I am very grateful to be here. I wanted to. Um, share a little bit about my Utsi connections as well, um, and our Nitsi, uh, my belly button connections. I'm from Salt Lake Cree Nation, and I'm Lana Whiskey Jack Treaty um, as well. I'm an artist and assistant professor at the Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Arts. Um, I'm also a graduate of the University Nith uh, Blue Quills. Um, I also work there for 12 years as an in instructor. It's also um, had a profound impact on not only me, but the, the belly buttons I come from, because prior to uh, it being a university, it was Blue Quills First Nations College since 1971. And prior to that, it was Blue Quills Indian Residential School. And so it's crazy to think that this school has been in existence for 90 years. It was built in 1931 and, and it was the first um, indigenous owned and operated educational institution. In fact, I think it's the only reserve in Canada specifically for education um, since 1971. And so my, a lot of our uh, 11 First Nations people who attended that school um, took over that school in 1970. And the Prime Minister uh, Trudeau at the time and the Indian Affairs Minister uh, Jean Chrétien, who was also a former uh, Prime Minister, uh, signed over that school. And so I, I wanted to acknowledge it because of like that uh, Nimis Roxanne talked about of the, how th that really um, indoctrinated us in this cultural view that we only have two genders. And of course, me being an Esquil, a girl, uh, being raised as a daughter and, um, and then growing up, um, seeing only the two genders as well as uh, a hearing homophobia within my home as well. And so I also wanted to acknowledge um, some of my teachings around the seven generations. Of course, that's kind of thinking of how, how do we think in seven generations so we leave the world a better place. I often think about when I finished high school, uh, Nokom Caroline, my mother's mother, um, who I called my big mama because she helped raise me too as a grandma's girl, is um, 
she would say when I finished high school, she she brought me a, a braid of sweet grass, a blanket she made, and with the four colors of ribbon. Um, she was a very ceremonial woman. She was she was the first generation to go to residential school, but she was also um, she was also a Catholic. She would go to church on Sundays, but go to ghost dance and 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 all you know chicken dances, peyote meetings on other days. Uh, so she was always open to to all kinds of world views and always looking at the good of taking the good of what she was learning. So Nukum would say, came, gave me those gifts of her blanket and that medicine and just talked about how, um, you know, uh, that traditional teaching Roxanne talked about, about knowing who, who you are and where you come from. And so it's kind of been my guiding um, advice I use throughout my education from, um, you know, as an artist and as now an academic and researcher. And so acknowledging, you know, the, that, um, you know, the seven generations of me being a part of that, right? So my auntie, I was, I was uh, fortunate enough to know my Zapan, my, um, my Cookham Caroline's father, mom stopped. And that's his wife, Maggie. So there's Maggie, then um, my Tapan, Nukum Caroline, Nigawi, Nia, me. And then I, um, I uh, of course, gave birth to uh, Nitans, my daughter, Serena. And then um, she had a girl. So I'm, I, I, as Roxanne mentioned, we're young grandmothers. Uh, and so I have my new some Amu. And, and then to think that she carries eggs and if she chooses to birth babies, then I will, I always think of my auntie's advice, um, her blessing. She's like, you know, you lived a long blessing life when you live long enough to meet your chapa and your great grandchildren. And I think how blessed I am that I got to meet my great grandfather who used to serenade us. And, uh, you know, he, he lived during the time of treaty signing. So he was able to see what, what the world came from the time he was young. And as a mother, um, how we have to carry those roles, those stories to remind our children of not forgetting who they are and where they come from in order to pass on. But so another part of, of so that's seven generations of how, you know, that traditional teaching of knowing where we come from, our tzapanak, anuk tzapan, our ancestors to, you know, our future generations. And the, not only of, of the responsibility we, we have to pass on, but also the responsibility of taking care of what has happened to us through intergenerational transmission, and not, of not only trauma, but also of wisdom that we carry. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So um, I am, a, as I mentioned, I am a mother of uh, three and I'm a grandmother of four, technically, if I wanna include my grand dog, um, Chino, um, my daughter at the end. And this photo was taken last year at the uh, Indigenous Art Park, Inu River Lot 11 near Queen Elizabeth Drive or Queen Elizabeth Park, and uh, here with my husband. And so, um, and then my son and my, my son-in-law and daughter-in-law and uh, my two, my grandchildren. And then my youngest, uh, Emery. So I wanted to share a quick little digital story uh, with you all to kind of... When I first... My firstborn, a boy, he became my son. Then my daughter was born. What I knew about parenting was boys were sons and girls were daughters. They were raised differently. When I gave birth to my last child, she was a girl, our daughter. We dressed her as a girl, treated her more delicately than we did our son. We referred to her with female pronouns, telling the world she was female. As an AEO mother, I carried an inherent fear for my children because of the systemic racism we Isinua were raised and live in. Then at the age of 11, she came out by the encouragement of her older sister and told us she had gender dysphoria. I had to Google it. She became a he. 
He explained to us he always felt as a he. Since he could assert his self-expression around the age of five, he preferred an androgynous look. We were not surprised. We didn't question it. We knew we had to change the way we parented. Now I know what I know. I see the stress he was living prior to being our son. Strengthening our family support through ceremony and Nehiawe Win was foundational to move through the challenging times. Parenting our transgender son, we had to rewire our brain's language to think and feel for our son, as well as to build our own skills and knowledge to help with the changes needed to normalize and accept diverse genders within our communities. I also needed to grieve for our daughter who carried so much pain as he was often bullied in schools and in public washrooms. The bullying he endured has had lasting impacts, not only on his mind and spirit, but also on his body, especially in public spaces. As parents, we hurt when our child hurts. And with the support of our spiritual family, we learned powerful knowledge and gifts through rites of passage. Our son had brilliant mentors who committed to being his kin he could rely on. We learn to be better parents by listening to our children. We have a vision of raising courageous, respectful, brilliant, loving human beings. So we made sure to build their communication skills so they may advocate for themselves. We worked to give them the support they needed to be courageous and not to interfere with their challenging learning experiences. And we are incredibly grateful to have been given this gift of learning through our courageous, amazing warrior son who leads, listens, and speaks from his heart. Nanaskumten Nikosis. So one of the, um, uh, I, I often, I always have to ask my son, I'm like, okay, created another digital story um, and ask for permission to be able to share these stories and just let him know how we're framing this work in case I need to change any of my language or work. So of course he's always reluctant on sharing um, any photos of himself because of the, you know, growing up disliking being uh, comfortable, disliking your body that you're born within, but also just the uncomfortableness that he carried for so long. And even though I always tell him how beautiful and amazing he is, he's still, you know, he's a teenager. So a lot of, and it's interesting because some of the things we, we often struggle with is with gender dysphoria is also the mental, spiritual, and physical issues that come with, with gender dysphoria, as well as um, transphobia. One of the, um, one of the, the things that we had to really work on, especially when we found out how he was being bullied in school, was um, his, his bladder issues, because a lot of the bullying happened within bathrooms. So he um, would often come home and, 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 and talk about how much pain his bladder was in. And we took him to, of course, doctors and specialists and couldn't find anything. And to this day, um, you know, he has these bodily issues because of bullying, of holding in his urine all day and how much that has changed his um, body. So there's, you know, that's just an example of some of the, the challenges we had in, 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 in dealing with other people's, you know, prejudice and hatred and fear around uh, transgender and diverse. Um, but of course, uh, you've seen in the last part of the video, uh, just this year, one of the things he is often very, um, uh, I had a hard time was standing straight. So actually standing straight. And I'm, of course, I'm a mother. So I'm like, stand straight, quit slouching over. But he would slouch over because he wanted to hide, you know, um, his, what we, we'd call him nodules, but of course his breast, his chest, because uh, he did have some, some uh, tissue. Um, and uh, so he wanted to, uh, 
that he's been asking since he was, uh, I think about 14, 15 of wanting to get them removed. And so um, he had them removed in January 6th. And so uh, he's, you know, now finally able to stand straight and um and and feel you know just even that act of standing straight makes you feel uh, a lot more better about being comfortable in your skin and of course sometimes we often would deal with depression as well uh, with gender dysphoria and so one of the things when our son first came out was uh at the as i mentioned at the age of 11 was talking about wanting to make sure that as parents, how are we going to help to build himself um, to be confident in who he is and to give him the skills and knowledge to be as as Newsom Roxanne talked about. Um, Newsom, I mean, <laughs> Nimbus, <laughs> Roxanne talked about, a, you know, of wanting them to be to be able to be uh, walk tall and, and, and not have to compromise themselves as a Nehio, as an Icenu, a being of this land. And so um, with the help of our wonderful spiritual family, um, Dr. James McCocus, who is also an, an amazing transgendered advocate, medical doctor who um, works with transgendered peoples as well as his husband, Anthony, um, their loving support, they, they really um, helped us to connect to uh, putting Emory through a rites of passage. And of course, traditionally for a female, when a, a young Esquileo has her first time bleeding or when her grandmothers come to visit her, uh, that's when we'd have a rites of passage. And so I, when um, Emory, um, my son, uh, started on hormone blockers. That's when he actually got his first time. So I had, I, I kept him at home and we had that rites of passage um, at home for, for, you know, that first blood. And then, um, and then when he started his testosterone at the age of 15 um, and his voice started cracking, that was the time we had to put him into uh, his male rites of passage. So we took him to an elder in Musquachis and brought protocol and gifts and, and, you know, that included, you know, blankets and aren't and sunyas. And, um, and then I also offered protocol and gifts to mentors because I knew it takes, it's going to take a group of us, a kinship system to help, um, to help lift uh, Emory during this time. And so we had our, our dear friend, Scott Eiserhoff, who's a chef, and his wife, Savetta, to help teach him and mentoring him into cooking. We had another friend who was a kinesiologist to help him build himself. Um, we had, of course, James and Anthony who have been, who, who rely on Emory as being on all scalp elves. And important, the importance of like the Cree language and helping to also shift our language and our, our ways of thinking is, is so important. And teaching our son that reciprocity, you know, that he's given these gifts. And so, and um, he has to honor that, uh, these gifts he's given and the support he's given by, of course, supporting others, uh, but also honoring himself as, as that, well, that, that all gendered human being. And so he's learning about his roles and responsibility. And he's, he's learning about this kinship system through the rites of passage. One of the most important, oh, profound part of his ceremony is rites of passage ceremony, which isn't, we had the ceremony of the sweat lodge and teachings and songs and all of that, but that ceremony goes on for years until uh, Emery is able to walk on his own kind of thing when he becomes a full, you know, that full nap bell as he wants to be. But in that ceremony, um, my, my son had to come out of the ceremony yelling, uh, almost like a sagwe of letting Nia Oma Nia, which means I am who I am. And I get emotional about this because to finally see my son stand up and acknowledge that for himself was so profound. To hear him, his voice 
with and the elder telling him you know no you have to say it louder you know and so he had to keep raising his voice until he he really believed it and so it was such an important part as a mother to see um, my son go through that and so now we we come to you know our because Roxanne and I have have been doing this work since well of course parenting since our, the birth of our children but taking that responsibility as parents and being you know relatives especially to Dr. James McCocus and, and Anthony Johnson of um, being voluntold you know we needed to as parents because we're such I guess strong um, strong grandmother presences um, and, and our belief systems around Nehiao, you know, our Nehiao ways of, of knowing and being is starting that indigenous parents and friends of lesbians and gays. And it was the first one in, uh, in Canada that we know of in 2015. I think I might've mixed, I didn't, my uh, corrections to this didn't save. So it was actually 2016. Um, so, and then in 2018, and I'll get my nemesis to talk about the ceremony to, uh, that we did to, to change that name. Yeah, many uh, grandparents raising their grandchildren were coming up to me saying, what is this that our, our grandchildren are identifying, identifying as gay, bi, lesbian, what is going on, right? And so I said, I hadn't support, I went through the transition of my Kwana transitioning into her womanhood by myself, and I just learned through a lot of trial and error. I thought, wow, there's so many coming out now that uh, we need to find a support system for them because I can only share one perspective of what I went through. So I went to research what uh, I was told to go to, uh, go to PFLAG, and I went to many meetings, but there was nothing that I could relate to in terms of who I am as an Indigenous woman. And so I was suggested to contact this IP flag, Indigenous P flag in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I said, how do you go about supporting, you know, friends and allies of LGBTQ and Q spirit? And that's where I came uh, across this IP flag. And I said, well, we want to start a chapter in Canada, in Edmonton. And so that's how that originated. From. But it still didn't identify who we were. And so I, I, I said, we need to take this to ceremony so we know who we are. And we are gifted, Sugumau Geheo Miguanak. And, you know, through our Indigenous humor, Lana's husband translated it to be uh, young eagles led by two old birds. <laughs> <laughs> but are those eagle feathers on an eagle staff that's who who uh, the grandmothers and grandfathers know us as when we started this this group called and being an employee of McEwen, we held monthly meetings open to the community uh, as allies to come and meet. We shared food, oftentimes neck bones and bannock and tea, and we'd have conversations around what our experiences were like. And then when Lana, the bless her heart, joined us, you know, then we were able to get it more structured because it was just like, how do we support one another in a meaningful manner and with purpose. And so that's where we are today. And so one of the things, you know, that we um, have been working on was, you know, how, how, well, how to be better relatives to our, our diverse genders. And because we're, we come from that very uh, Nehia worldview, um, will we, we're, we're, we're working and growing this, these values within our, our organization. So Nemes, you could talk about the Atzak. So in my perspective, we all have different teachers and different lodges that we attend to acquire this spiritual knowledge. And so in my teachings, I'm told and reminded that creator, the creator that we know, the God, the Allah Buddha, the higher deity that we know to be, uh, only sees us as light. And those loved ones that have gone on before us, the ancestors, we call them grandmothers, grandfathers, 
creators, helpers and workers at the Yukonak, uh, they only see us as light. They don't see the barriers that we create in this physical world to Eurocentric worldview of the gender, the age, the sex, the culture, the language, the ethnicity. Through my teachings, I am told creator and the ancestors only from where they reside in spirit world only see us as light. But naturally, we have to adapt to the changes of these worlds. And I'm blessed my sister carries, you know, the connection to these elders who have the additional world of here in this physical world of these eight genders. So one of the, as uh, with OKM that we are growing, is learning more about our traditional worldviews, again, through the language and through those roles and responsibilities and making sure that the families and, and friends who want to come and learn these ways are connected to those elders and knowledge keepers and to other families. So they're also expanding and building their, their kinship systems. So one of the, uh, we've invited uh, my, my, my auntie and uncle, Jerry and Joanne Saddleback um, to come and teach our, our, our worldview, our Cree worldview on these, on these eight genders, which kind of just blew my mind when I was, when I first learned about this. And I was able to come um, learn a lot of being connected uh, and directed to this knowledge through our our, our um, organizational and kinship connection to Edmonton Two-Spirit Society. So we work a lot with our Edmonton Two-Spirit Society. A couple of years ago, uh, when the Pride Parade was canceled, um, as of course with POKM, we are like, okay, well, well, everyone can have the party. We're gonna have a ceremony um, for our, our families. And so when the Pride Parade was canceled, Edmonton Two-Spirit joined us and we hosted a non-gendered restricted um, sweat lodge at our um, James and Anthony's place where everyone gets to learn about the, the amount of work it takes to go into that uh, to host ceremonies, but also um, had invited our elders, uh, Jerry and Joanne Saddleback to come and teach about these eight genders, which I'll briefly I won't get into them too much because it, it, it there are a lot of um, I mean, these should be tobacco offerings to our, our elders to learn more about. But you know, of course, we had the Esquo and Napo, the female and male, um, the two spirit who um, they're the ones who work with all kind of um, the, the genders and from lack of better language. And so eventually we'll have them all in Cree. But we also have the Iqbal, those female uh, uh, center kind of genders who I uh, was uh, reminded of stories of, of, of them being warriors. They would be the ones who would be taught the ways of warriors and, and the first law of a warrior is peace. So, you know, we'd all been those female centered genders that would, would bring peace during conflict. And we have our contrary backwards people, our, 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 our asexual, like looking at those different roles and response. And each of these beings have their own ceremonies, their own songs, their own medicines that help contribute to the well being of all the people, of all the community members. And then you have the Motsagan or clown, and I'm sure. Many of you know of people who are like that, who come into a room and just switch that energy to make it more fun. They lift the energy. And then you have the I well, the all gendered or you know, androgynous fluid genders who again they can be in any space. So we need to learn a lot about those, especially when we're engaged in our, our ceremonies. Um, one of the other um work that we've been starting to do is bringing back that land that land base and arts based um, practices through experiential learning you know so last year we hosted our first um, all gendered high tanning cap um, of course by learning and seeing and it's interesting because when we bring elders or different community members who carry specific knowledge we have we ask that we remind them that this is this is a space where we don't give gender restrictions because a lot of those teachings as those diverse genders, they can sit in a female or male sub because in our ceremonies, we have very kind of 
strict protocols of just being a woman in, in ceremony, right? Um, and I don't know if there, if you wanted to also add to that, Nimis. No, that's good. No, go ahead. Okay. So we we want to make sure that we're teaching the language and the cultural skills, uh, the knowledge, the stories, the songs, while engaging by actually connecting to the land. The land is so vital in learning your roles and responsibilities, and of course, it also helps to strengthen. Um, relations between families of working together. And so the, the example <clears throat> of my, uh, my husband and my son, you know, they, um, my son has been kind of doing this work for a long time, um, that he, he, he's able to actually, you know, boss his dad around to correct his father <laughs> which you know doesn't happen too often where and and so those roles of being able to help you know um come into your voice and 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 so my husband and I have always kind of taught our kids that we'll be there in a in will be their biggest advocates, but will also be their bullies so they learn how to deal with difficult people sometimes and and yeah, they will totally <laughs> could tell lots of stories about that. I have one thing to add, Lena, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, strengthening kinship, because not many of our LGBTQ spirit are safe to come out to family and community and nation that we've had to adopt in that traditional kinship system because our teaching is that we never should ever feel that we're ever by ourselves because in this uh, day and age we can adopt those mothers fathers grandma grandpa sisters aunties brothers sisters that carry the traits that we admire and even though some are disconnected for whatever reason no judgment you know they can so many of uh, uh LGBTQ who come to me at OKM, I said, I can't talk to my mother, I can't talk to my father, I can't talk to my family about my being gay. And so I've become the gokum to many of them or the auntie or the mother, however they want to relate to me, to be able to create those safe spaces so that we can have open conversation with them with where, they at, where they're at. And so we resume that practice at OKM. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So one of the thing, you know, it's so important, of course, with a with rites of passage and as parents who are supporting those ceremonial is making sure that um, we have a strong vision of, of what we want to do and accomplish as parents and as you know, grandmothers of our nations, but also for our our our, our children. So um, we uh, want to strengthen, of course, the personal autonomy through Nehiawewin, the ceremony in land and arts-based practices and experiential learning. And, um, and, and through OKM, we're working on de developing a rites of passage for our urban um, diverse genders within, within our communities of going through a fasting, of naming, preparing, and learning how to help. And we know that that ceremony through lots of research that's been out there, to be able to um, that ceremony is vital in helping pe helping our our personal well being, of uh, being healthy, and so if we want to you know create some powerful uh, interventions and preventions for for diseases and for unhealthiness is that we need to we need to get our young people and our our families involved with with rites of passage, and so cut two years ago. I went fasting for this work with OKM and it wasn't until after the fasting that I had the grandmother visits and they came to tell me because I used to do work um, my research work was in sexual health and so uh, they said that if you want you know in order to continue that work um, of addressing sexual violence or gender violence is to build the skills and the knowledge uh, within our, our diverse gender young people or our diverse genders, period, and that we should be helping to nurture them because they're the ones who will be ending, um, who will be ad addressing and unnormalizing gender and sexual violence within our communities. So that's kind of been a very strong vision of why I do what I do as a mother. 
Um, and, and my kid always makes fun of me. He's like, why do you always get invited to talk about the two spirit, diverse gender stuff? You're, you're a cis heterosexual woman. You know? <laughs> I'm like, cause I'm your mother. <laughs> I'd like to add her, um, Lana too, you know, uh, for those of you that don't know, I unfortunately had a stroke on December the 8th of the year, just over a year ago. And in my near-death experience, the grandmother came to me and said, you know, you have to go back, you have to go back and uh, focus on the youth. So, so that's why I guess Lana and I are aligned together as young grandmothers and mothers to bring this work forward. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of want to spend the last 15 minutes now of being able to have um, be open to any questions or comments. Uh, thank you so much, um, Lana and Roxanne, for sharing um, your stories. Uh, we do have uh, one question that has been um, written from Margaret and it reads, I'm so appreciative and envious of Indigenous knowledge and ceremony that provides unconditional support of members of the Two-Spirit community. It is an inspiration for those of us from other cultures as we build our own communities in support of those who identify as members of the LGBTQ2S plus community. Can you comment on ways to build community without engaging in cultural appropriation? Well, just be open and willing uh, just to learn a different worldview is my suggestion. Because through Indigenous worldview, when you hear of ceremony, that's your invitation to go. You don't need a formal invitation, you know. And if you don't know what preparation is, just contact one of us now that you've made a connection to Indigenous communities. And we can walk you through what that may be like. Uh, and what to anticipate. And if you have to sit on my lap, I tease faculty, sit on my lap during ceremony. We don't care. The important, important uh, thing to remember is that you're here with us in community and relationship. And we invite, as OKM, we invite people who want to learn these ways. One of the things is, is that we have these ceremonies and traditional views, but it's not often that our community actually practices um, the openness. As, as we both mentioned, we still, our children has ex experienced homophobia and transphobia within our communities and families. And so this is why we're doing what we're doing, but also opening it up for other peoples who wanna learn these ways. Um, I've been part of rites of passage for young girls in my community at Sad Lake for years. And we were actually invited to um, the clan's mothers, uh, Louise McDonald out in Aquasasne to come and see, visit their rites of passage ceremony. And I was reminded by some of my elders and my mentors and my family, um, ceremonial family, that it's good to, to look at other cultures, but it's so important to look at our own first and bringing that back and keep digging and keep offering those protocols and keep going to ceremonies. And so that's the beauty of our, of our ways or Nehio ways is that we're, we're always open to sharing. It's one of our laws to share. Um, and how to not culturally appropriate is, is just sit and listen. Don't take leadership. Don't, um, don't, you know, don't come and listen and then take it back and, and, and lead. Um, make sure you're inviting those knowledge keepers and those elders and grandmothers to come and share what they've, they've worked so all their life in and speaking from their languages. Um, so uh, creating those spaces to offer um, these stories to be told is, is another important way of, of not culturally appropriating, letting, letting the people speak their stories by, yeah. yeah. Allowing their narrative to be expressed. And I always joke in, in the faculty of nursing is, is don't come with your white coat and your clipboards. Yeah. <laughs> Leave that at the door. <laughs> Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And I, um, I'm, I know, um, as a mother, 
uh, and as someone who does this work professionally, to know that there are so many ways um, to access this information and not just in the in the academic sense, because that's where I know my mind always goes, but honoring the the whole person, their the spiritual aspect, their their connections to their their families, that kinship, is a really great reminder for me. Um, um, and just to know that there are people in our community that can offer that wisdom is is really heartening. My kiddo is very young still, but um, we've got lots of adventures ahead, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, um, if you have a question that you'd like to pose, uh, all those folks who are still here, um, you can raise your hand and I will uh, use my magic buttons to allow you to talk. So don't be shy. And uh, or you can use the Q&A at the bottom. Um, I, I was making notes, little little tidbit notes while you were talking. There's so many beautiful parenting reminders. Um, the whole piece around we learn to be better parents when we listen to our children um and that really spoke to me um right now you know our kids are always telling us something but it's not always in a way that we are open to listening and understanding it's not my kid isn't coming to me and sitting me down with with grown-up understandings of the world around her so the way that I listen um, has to change. It's not just with my ears, but with my eyes and with my heart, because she has a story to tell. And um, so I, that piece of, that phrase came just in time, because that's the space that we're in right now with our, with our kiddo. So, um, so thank you for that. And I love these, the way you phrase belly button connections. I'd never heard that phrase before. It's so, it's so beautiful. Um, my kid has also been asking a lot about belly buttons lately and about understanding that connection and, and what that meant and, and how we all have one. And um, just, just like so many lessons in life, you, this session has come at the exact right time that I needed to hear these things. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you would like to, um, are there any other resources other than the organization that you have talked about, which I think is really great? Uh, are there any other places for knowledge that you would like to direct people who have questions about this? Um, podcasts, websites, books, art, uh, poetry, um, where where can people continue their journey of knowledge? Hi, I'm uh, I'm actually just in the process of uh, creating a course at the university on indigenous um, sexual and gender I indigenous sexual gender identities, and um, I'm also working on a research project with with strengthening relations and supporting our diverse genders and our communities. Um, with OKM, Edmonton to Spirit is such a great place. There's um, Pride Center now has a lot more uh, cultural um, resources as well. I mean, Billy uh, Joe Belcourt is an amazing um, poet. There's just, yeah, there's a lot of incredible work. There's um, one of the books I'll be using is on Two-Spirit People, Native American Gender Identity, Sexuality, Spirituality. Um, hopefully in the near future, I'll get our literature review up so you can actually see a lot of the literature out there. Um, and we'll post on, on my profile at the university. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of, you know, and of course, you know, looking up J Dr. James McCocus and his husband, Anthony Johnson, who are constantly sharing um, and being advocates for the diverse genders and transgender uh, community. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have another question. Uh, from Emily here, and it says, I'm Métis, and I have always felt unsure if I can claim certain identities, particularly being Two-Spirit. I suppose the question is whether or not it's something I know within myself, or if it's brought up in ceremony. I'm 
And that's, of course, a question that I cannot answer. <laughs> um, you want to start? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, it was interesting as having this kind of conversation recently with with um, with a friend around a two spirit friend about like how two spirit is like a term, a kind of a doorway into when we were talking about when I was asking these kind of questions as well, a doorway of um, for people to just go through and explore how to identify themselves, right? Especially as um, um, when I think about one of my elders um, who, uh, who said, you know, if you have a little bit of, of indigenous blood of it, then you come from this land, you are of this land, right? So oftentimes when we say we're Métis First Nations, Inuit, we're separating ourselves by the government's I, I categorization, that we, we separate ourselves from that traditional knowledge that Nimis Roxanne brought up of Wakotowin you know, of how do we become related again? And so this is the work we're doing of constantly exploring our English language through Cree ways of thinking of, of broadening that. So identity is such a, oh, wow, <laughs> complex. <laughs> um, so definitely finding it in ceremony is a very good way to start. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I, I mean, I feel like I could just, I would love to keep you here for hours and hours and just <laughs> keep listening and ask questions. Um, but obviously we have, uh, we do have to respect people's time. Um, I am deeply grateful that you took the time to be a part of our proceedings this week and um, give us insight into your journeys, very, very personal and very deep. Uh, experiences with your children. Um, I, you know, I really identified with the emotional stories that you shared with us, um, even as a white cis het woman um, in Treaty Six land. Um, some, some of those experiences are universal. Um, that love for our children and our, our desire for them to be their full and happy selves. So thank you for, for this. Um, I will just say to all of our attendees, I will be uh, emailing you a, uh, a short a short survey as part of uh, my desire to constantly offer uh, excellent programming um, at McEwen and in the, in in our in our city. So I, I hope you have an opportunity to to do that. I do want to acknowledge that the um, the closed captioning was really not what I was hoping today. Um, it did obviously it does not designed to understand Cree words and that's something that we need to we need to improve. So when we do look back at the record um, of our talk, there might be uh, some questions because it doesn't um, might not make sense. So I apologize to those who were who were using the subtitles today if um, some of the messages were were muddled coming across. Um, but please contact me if you would like any kind of clarification. I do have a recording of this, so we might be able to offer a better closed captioning service uh, in the future. So, so, uh, so there's that. So, um, if there, if you have any final thoughts in our final minutes today that you would like to offer, or any closing that you have prepared, um, I, I yield the floor to you again. Any closing remarks, Lennon? I'll close with the grandmother's song. Maria, just a big thank you to McEwen for this opportunity and my big sister here, Roxanne, for being such an amazing support. Hey, yeah, I guess I would like to close. I always ask my, my daughter, Kwana, I said, what should I tell this audience, right? What should I tell this audience is, oh, mom, who are you talking to today, right? Uh, and uh, I said, I'm speaking to Mennonite, to congregation of Mennonite. Ah, what are you doing there? <laughs> but uh, one, one, uh, one statement she always makes to me is like, despite our challenges and our differences and the barriers we've had to hope overcome, she always says, mom, you just love me. 
you just loved me. So if I have any final words to share with you, it's just love, love those little angels that are on loan to us and try and just keep an open mind, open heart to all the lessons they have to, uh, to share with us and uh, walk together in that beauty of uh, their true essence. So in closing, I want to close with the grandmother song because to give thanks to those Lutuguateokan that guides me in the work that I do and Nisim is here, my young sister, that we hope we do this work justice by sharing our truth in the different uh, capacities that we are involved in because this song tell, speaks about the strength, healing and hope of all nations that we can combat even this pandemic with understanding of and respect for creation, you know, and the importance of sharing, the importance of sagitu in love, the importance of embracing each other regardless of our differences. If we are going to really make the changes necessary to combat these obstacles of systemic racism and discrimination and violence, sexual violence, you know. So we have no more necessities for missing murdered Indigenous women reports, right? Uh, no more need for offices of the Human Rights Commission, right? So this is our hope for each and every one of you. And again, we thank you, as my sister said, for this opportunity to come and share two perspectives of Indigenous women from Treaty 6 uh, and their uh, parenting experiences with these wonderful children, trans children, and now young adults. This is her song. into our communities, into our nations, 10 times more. They're that much more powerful. So I encourage you all to make a look when you have an opportunity to share your songs. So with that, there's no goodbyes in Cree culture. It's only a samina. Go up and to know when the upper opportunities arise, we will see each other again. So with that, hi, hi. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, everyone. We wish you a wonderful day. Take care.